Of course, it's no secret that the factors affecting st strategic stability between the U.S. and Russia today are deeper and broader than just nuclear arms control. That's the voice of Sahil Shah, policy fellow at the European Leadership Network. He's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Tom Kalina and Michelle Dope. Welcome back to Press the Button. Hi, Michelle. Great to see you as always. As you might be able to see, I am reporting from beautiful southern New Hampshire, where the leaves are changing. I'm looking out the window now, and I see, you know, yellows and oranges and reds, and um, it's a great time to be checking out the fall foliage. And how are you? I'm well, I'm well, and we are releasing this episode on Indigenous Peoples Day. So I want to say I am taping this from the ancestral home of the Piscataway and Nacoshtank. We hope that you take a moment today to learn more about the history of the land that you're on. And thank you, Michelle, for um, giving me a link for how to figure out what uh, lands I am on right now in southern New Hampshire. Uh, I took advantage of that and found out that I am on the lands of the Penacook, Wabanaki, and Abenaki tribes. Uh, and apologies to members of those tribes if I mispronounce the names. But um, it was great to be able to figure out that history of this land. So, Michelle, thank you very much. News from last week. Uh, just doing a brief news update here. Uh, President Biden will be meeting with President Xi of China for their first summit later this year. Uh, that summit will be virtual because of COVID-19. And also announced last week, the Biden administration revealed how many nuclear weapons America actually has, abandoning uh, a Trump-era policy of nuclear secrecy. These were numbers that were normally put out regularly until Trump stopped it uh, during his Rain and the Biden administration is now restarting it, which is great. Uh, so the U.S. had 3,750 warheads in its stockpile as of a year ago, about September 2020. Uh, and in addition, there are about 2,000 retired warheads in storage awaiting dismantlement. So if you look at that stockpile number uh, since 2017, that's a drop of about only 72 warheads. Come on, folks, I think we can do better. Uh, today on Early Warning, we will discuss how Iranians have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and how the Biden administration has an opportunity to help uh, with a pledge to vaccinate uh, people in Iran and around the world. I think this is an important opportunity for the Biden administration uh, to show some goodwill toward the Iranian people. Totally agree, Tom. And then after that, I sit down with Sahil Shah, a policy fellow at the European Leadership Network and advisor to the Office of the Executive Secretary at the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization, as well as the Institute for Security and Technology. We discuss all things nuclear coming from a transatlantic perspective, since he is located in London. We're talking about the U.S.-Russian dialogue that just occurred and what that means for the New START Treaty. We talk about the prospects for the JCPOA and Europe's role in those discussions. So you're not going to want to miss it. Looking forward to that. And of course, as always, if you like what you hear, dear listeners, please remember to hit subscribe and leave us a rating. Your feedback helps us improve the show. And with that, let's get into the episode. The clock is ticking. And now... Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thank you, Dell. As podcast listeners know, the Biden administration's crucial efforts to get back into the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran have hit a wall, with talks stalled since Iran's new president was elected in June. We simply need to get these talks back on track before it's too late. And one creative idea is to build some goodwill by helping Iran fight COVID-19. Cases are spiking in Iran, and its leaders recently said they would start importing vaccines from the West. And this creates an important opportunity for the Biden administration. 
And here to tell us more about this is Sina Tusi. He is a senior research analyst at the National Iranian American Council. Sina, great to have you here. Hi, Tom. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So let, let's start with the basics. How bad is the COVID-19 pandemic right now in Iran? So COVID has been devastating for Iran. It's been one of the hardest hit countries in the Middle East. Upwards of 130,000 people have been confirmed to have died from COVID. Even Iranian health ministry officials acknowledge that this is an undercount. And studies have shown that the excess deaths for COVID in Iran during this period that the disease has hit, it's been 250,000. That seems like a more accurate number. This was a study done by BBC Persian. But Iran's uh, challenges with the, with the pandemic have been compounded by a dire economic situation that, it, that was already really devastated by U.S. sanctions over the past several years. So Iran has been unable to kind of give the kind of economic reliefs or the kind of shutdowns that we've seen in many other parts of the world. And sanctions have also had an impact uh, in kind of limiting the kind of medicines that Iran is able to import. And Iran has also had issues with kind of vaccine imports as well over the past year. And so the crisis there has really been compounded by a number of other factors. So I, I would imagine that when uh, President Trump pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal, the sanctions went back on. That had a negative effect on Iran's ability to fight COVID? Yes. Um, we know that early on in the pandemic, um, there were documented reports from the UN and other international organizations that Iran was having, for example, trouble importing uh, coronavirus test kits early on. Um, we know from kind of reports done by Human Rights Watch and other organizations that, you know, throughout this maximum pressure period, Iran has far more difficulty importing a lot of life-saving medicines, especially for rare diseases, um, as well as insulin. And even right now, for COVID, I know from even from my family in Iran, people who have contracted COVID, finding a lot of these medicines is very difficult. And they increasingly have to turn to the black market, unfortunately, and buy these medicines at you know, skyrocket high prices. Since things have gotten much worse uh, regarding COVID in Iran, um, Iran is now open to importing vaccines from the West when it initially was not. Is that right? Yes. So, I mean, the Iranian government's mismanagement of the pandemic cannot be understated either. Among many missteps that the Iranian government took was Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, actually in January of this year, he explicitly banned uh, British and American vaccines. And this was a, you know, motivated by political reasons. And actually, just in August, when the Delta variant hit Iran and the Delta variant really wreaked a lot of havoc, you know, the daily death rate hit unprecedented levels. Khamenei backtracked this ban and said that, you know, that as many vaccines from all kinds of sources need to be imported. He gave a much more kind of comprehensive kind of rhetoric saying that all, you know, Iran should just import as many vaccines as it can. And since then, though, there's still been, you know, these issues with Iran where there's been contradictory messages. So at first you had the health ministry come out a few weeks ago and say that Iran is going to import the Pfizer vaccine, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson. And they even said they had uh, signed a contract to import 2.4 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine from the Pfizer subsidiary in Belgium. But now, just several days ago, again, there was a political backlash, again, from these kind of very reactionary forces in Iran. And also, politically, it's not a good look, ultimately. You know, people have been pointing this out in Iran that, you know, so many Iranians were made a victim to the virus for these political games. Khamenei banned the, the vaccines. And then while the moderate Rouhani was in office, Iran had, a, they were still not really importing a lot of vaccines. And when Raisi came to office, all of a sudden they're reversing this stuff, trying to import as many vaccines as they can. A lot of people were, were uh, pointing this out. And I think it was embarrassing ultimately for the top echelons of Iran's government. And now they're walking back the Pfizer approval. So last week they said they're going to import 2.4 million doses of the Pfizer vaccine, but now they're giving a number of different reasons. One is that they've had difficulties with their intermediary companies to import them, but also that 
you know, these political constraints are real. And many people in Iran, especially with Pfizer, there's this, this sensitivity about importing the Pfizer vaccine. But with that said, there's still a lot more that the U.S. and other countries can do to deliver vaccines and other COVID-82 Iran. So, so let's get to exactly that. What specifically can the Biden administration do at this point to get more vaccine to Iran? And how might that help the prospects for the nuclear deal? Yeah, so the U.S. could help Iran procure vaccines from third countries or more vaccines from the WHO's COVAX program. You know, there are sensitivities to directly receiving aid from, from the United States, political sensitivities and opposition within Iran. But the U.S., for example, right now, because of the maximum pressure campaign, Iran has an estimated $100 billion of its own money frozen in bank accounts across the world. And one proposal that I have put forward in a recent op-ed is that some of this money could be unfrozen and used exclusively for humanitarian purchases uh, by Iran, including potentially through this Swiss humanitarian channel that actually the Treasury Department set up under the Trump administration to facilitate humanitarian uh, exports to Iran. And so this would be Iran's, you know, this would be, the, this would entail the U.S. greenlighting a country like South Korea or Japan to release some of Iran's own money. And that money being channeled through something like the Swiss humanitarian channel and used exclusively for you by Iran to purchase humanitarian goods, including COVID vaccines and other kind of medicines and drugs that they need to combat this, this uh, pandemic. And I think it's very important to disconnect this from the, the negotiations to get the nuclear deal, because you know this is a humanitarian crisis and the US, I would argue as a moral obligation to try to help Iran in this regard. And it's just the right thing to do regardless. And President Biden has pledged to you know, vaccinate the world and Iran should be a part of that. Iran and other sanctioned countries should be a part of that. But at the same time, this could also help build goodwill. You know, what is really lacking between the US and Iran with you know, this experience of the Trump administration and maximum pressure is the trust that had built between the US and Iran under Obama and the Rouhani administration negotiating the JCPOA, all the, you know, Iran's foreign minister and the U.S. Secretary of State, you know, meeting. And there was a trust after decades of hostility that had been built. That was just totally demolished by President Trump's policies towards Iran. And so we need steps to rebuild this confidence and kind of the U.S. as the party that first left the deal that imposed maximum pressure as a kind of goodwill overture to kind of release these funds by Iran and enable Iran to use them for humanitarian purposes, could help rebuild this trust. There has been rhetoric from Iranian officials as well that a goodwill overture could help the negotiation. So I think the U.S. has nothing to lose. You know, if it helps, it'll help the nuclear negotiations. And if not, it's the right thing to do. And it's a, it's a humanitarian action that the Iranian people direly need. There is the siren, and we are unfortunately out of time. Uh, please do check out Sina's new op-ed in Defense One on these issues. It's terrific. Sina, thank you so much for being on the show, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you, Tom. Take care. Sahil Shah is currently a policy fellow at the European Leadership Network and advisor to the Office of the Executive Secretary at the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization and the Institute for Security and Technology. He's also the 2021 winner of the Gorbachev Schultz Voices Youth Award. Today, we're going to be talking all things nuclear from a transatlantic perspective. Sahil, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Michelle. I'm really honored to be here. Recently, we saw the start of U.S.-Russian strategic stability talks. What were the outcome and what are the chances for building towards a follow-on agreement to New START? Yeah, first and foremost, um, some context for your listeners on this latest iteration of bilateral U.S.-Russia dialogue on strategic issues. Um, the talks that were launched by Presidents Biden and Putin this summer occur more than, more than 75 years since the first leader level meeting between the US, then represented by President Roosevelt and Soviet Union represented then by Premier Stalin. And that actually happened in Tehran in 1943. Since then, there have been nearly three dozen leader level summits between the two sides, and they've had mixed results. Some of those meetings failed, but others led to rather transformational outcomes like risk reduction measures, political declarations, agreements, treaties, and so on. 
the key for there being positive results has always been the formation of a sustained process with diverse representation on both the political and military level on both sides. In turn, the result of the latest plenary session between the US and Russia last week in Geneva is at the very least laying the groundwork for better understandings and awareness between the two sides on threat perceptions and resulting priorities. And that is a win in and of itself because we've not had serious talks like that in basically a decade and sometimes we forget that fact. Now that two working groups have been established, one on the principles and objectives for future arms control and another on capabilities and actions with strategic effects, both sides can vamp up intercessional consultations at the expert level within government so that when the forthcoming plenaries are convened, we can start to think about the products or outputs that help bring about the outcomes that everyone wants to see. We're obviously far from that point, it's just the beginning, um, but in terms of what this can mean in terms of building towards a follow-on agreement to new start, my conversations with both American and Russian officials have led me to believe that for now, the two sides are not looking for a treaty or a grand bargain, but more of a package of legal and political agreements that can be either taken in concert or in partnership. And there is of course a difference between those two things, but put together, we could really come up with something great. Now, these talks are coming after following years of deteriorating arms control and security treaties, such as Open Skies and INF. How do European countries view these talks? Uh, yeah, as an American stationed here in London, I'm often asked about the European viewpoint on a lot of the issues that we work on. And I always begin by saying that I wish there was a single homogenous opinion on the problems and how to solve them. But there is a very wide spectrum of views, both within countries and also between them. So to dial back, I think it's important to note that there are also, therefore, diverse perspectives on what constitutes strategic stability in a West Russia context, and that the role of nuclear weapons as a factor in those perspectives varies greatly. Of course, it's no secret that the factors affecting st strategic stability between the US and Russia today are deeper and broader than just nuclear arms control. The good news is that what was announced from that 30 December Geneva meeting that we just talked about looks like a meaningful compromise between the U.S. desire to go deeper on nuclear systems and the Russian desire to go broad by covering in everything that they're calling a new strategic equation. So this outcome, to go deeper and to go broader, is seen as a positive one by many Europeans as it can yield more meaningful solutions to deal with what they see as today's challenges to strategic stability. And those solutions will have positive externalities for Europe. But the issue is that there is a growing sense from Europeans that they're only being informed of progress rather than being consulted or being provided space to provide meaningful input. There's not going to be a large renewal of the European security architecture. And Europeans don't want to be left to fend for themselves. They want to feed in where their interests are at stake. And I think that they should. So taking your excellent point that Europe is not a monolith, um, though you do have some actors like the European Union who can speak on behalf of a group of countries, what do you see as various actors within Europe's roles when it comes to U.S.-Russian arms control negotiations? Are there any countries or bodies that you think are playing an active role in this? Definitely. Um, I participated in a wonderful training on conflict mediation this week, and the facilitator, um, Joan McGregor of South Africa, said something to me when we were walking to the train station together yesterday. She said, when it comes to teaching and learning, there's a difference between telling or being told and exploring together. So I really feel strongly that there needs to be a different mindset from the U.S. when it comes to the European role in the bilateral talks with Russia. We need transatlantic exploration of these issues, especially as there is an appetite for dialogue with Russia. 
For example, Berlin and Paris proposed a reset for EU relations with Moscow this summer, shortly after the Biden-Putin summit. So there are a number of ways in which certain key US allies can be brought in as conversations that specifically have their interests um, at heart. The natural follow-up, of course, to your question is, well, where should those consultations happen between Americans and Europeans? And there are a lot of options, but I'll name three. Um, one is obviously the, the North Atlantic Council and its subsidiary bodies, because just as important as US-Russia dialogue is, so is wider NATO-Russia dialogue. And that's a key area that the European Leadership Network, the ELN, works on. There's also the US-EU working groups on Russia and strategic stability that were set up. And then there's also the P3, um, the US, the UK, and France, which could then also expand to include Germany or maybe even Poland for a more Eastern European viewpoint as well. So there's a number of ways in which these consultations could happen now that there is a process underway. These kinds of consultations should be thought about deeply. And the issues that are gonna be covered in the bilateral US-Russia talks, because they are seemingly going to be again, as I said, broad and deep, the Americans need to identify where European insight would be valuable. And there are gonna be a number of issues where that is definitely the case. Moving away from arms control, you know, to talk about the Iran deal, Europe has been very involved. Um, what are the UK, France, Germany, and the European Union, who are all parties to the agreement, hoping comes out of these next few weeks as we look to see if talks restart? As many listening are likely aware, we've hit a pause in the indirect talks between the US and Iran on their mutual return to full implementation of the JCPOA. It's now been a few months. It's not looking good. During the last uh, you know, half dozen rounds of negotiations in Vienna this year, the Europeans were playing a key role. Um, you know, the EU technically played host and convened those talks, and the E3 more specifically were routinely acting as an intermediary between the US and Iran. As a result, the technical roadmaps on both nuclear restrictions and sanctions relief are actually largely completed, but the outstanding issues are more to do with political guarantees, and this is the biggest hurdle that now remains. For example, the US and the E3 are quite keen to get a commitment from Iran to engage in follow-on talks on what some are calling a stronger and longer deal. Unfortunately, there's actually not transatlantic cohesion on what a stronger and longer deal even means. For example, the UK feels that it should focus solely on getting better nuclear restrictions and trying to provide a better economic quid pro quo, whereas others like France are very keen on seeing things like missiles being included. Iran, which has not been able to see the benefits of the JCPOA for a number of years, feels that it already took a gamble agreeing to that original deal and that now it has been badly burned. So talks of a follow-on make no sense for them at this stage as they're more focused on guarantees that relate to ensuring that the U.S. will make the original deal, the JCPOA, more durable and sustain it before they can even think about it being a foundation for something more. It's clear that despite these outstanding concerns, players from greater Europe, so not just the E3, but also Russia, want Iran to formally come back to the table and most importantly, continue discussions from where they left off. However, Iran is in no rush, which is a gamble. Why? Well, first, they feel that the Biden administration has simply continued Trump's maximum pressure strategy, you know, not even really meaningfully easing humanitarian trade during a pandemic. And second, that san sanctions have seemingly hit a saturation point. While there's also a lot of room, however, for Iran to expand its nuclear program and build its own leverage, so why not take that opportunity? The key question then becomes, is Iran overestimating its capability to withstand pressure and build leverage, whilst also underestimating the consequences? I really feel that patience from Europe and also from Washington 
is not going to last much longer. So we all as experts are indeed urging all the parties that we work with that resuming talks is very important. At the same time, there's also an issue because we need to preserve the continuity of knowledge on the ground. When I was in Vienna a few weeks ago, I had a pleasure of sitting down with the IAEA Director General, Rafael Grossi, at a time when the Russians and others were helping facilitate a trip by him to Tehran to try to revitalize the political dialogue between the agency and the new Raisi administration. The result of that trip was quite successful, but now it seems that it's been put into doubt because the inspectors have not been able to go and service um, one of the facilities. So it just goes to show how fragile and delicate the situation is. And the E3, Russia and others would like to see these issues solved because the agency's work has to be supported so that if and when we get to a place where the nuclear deal is restored, there are no gaps. And lastly, which is a priority, but perhaps not the biggest priority, is that the E3 are very, very strongly in favor of a resolution to this outstanding question that exists about the material accountancy, the traces of material that the agency found and what the trail is. You know, they're not looking into possible military dimensions or weaponization. They simply would like some answers about the trail of that material. And they feel that the information they've been given thus far isn't adequate or doesn't necessarily add up. Staying on the topic of nonproliferation, we are now in the lead up to the NPT review conference, which is tentatively scheduled for January, um, where the P5's progress, the weapon states' progress on various treaty commitments, especially disarmament, is going to come under a lot of scrutiny. How does the role of wider risk reduction play into this, as you were talking about earlier? What are some areas in which we need to see risks reduced? Risk reduction is a tricky one because it is seen by much of the world as a smokescreen or distraction from meaningful progress on disarmament. However, as one ambassador recently told me very aptly, if this is the only conversation that the P5 or the N5, the five nuclear weapon states under the NPT are willing to have, we should hold them to it and we should call for strong results and put some good ideas forward. So the P5 process, which was chaired by the UK last year, France this year, and potentially the US next year, is helping facilitate dialogue on key issues amongst these weapon states, especially in the lead up to the RevCon, as you mentioned. The P5 will actually convene at the principles level in early December in Paris. And in the meantime, they're exchanging a lot of proposals and papers and specifically actually on risk reduction. After that, it'll be of particular interest when the P5 present not only their national implementation reports to the RevCon, but also their nuclear doctrines at a joint side event at the RevCon that will be the result of the deliberations of one of the five work streams of the P5 process. That work stream on doctrines and risk reduction is trying to frame risk reduction through more strategic rather than what they feel are too narrowly nuclear terms. This is because they feel that the biggest nuclear risks today reside in misperception and miscommunication. So such an approach means that the emphasis is on things like increasing understanding, comprehension, transparency on policies, including through the aforementioned work on doctrines, as well as working to establish effective crisis management and communication tools. The latter is something that I'm quite invested in. Um, as you mentioned, I'm advising the Institute for Security and Technology in San Francisco on Catalink, short for Catastrophe Link, which aims to be a 21st century hotline. Robust communications are critical, and any new hotline has to be multilateral today. There's no question about it. And it also needs to be internationally driven and secure, which, which means that it needs to be resilient in the face of hacking, signal interception, firmware, software, hardware vulnerabilities, um, environmental degradation, and other threats. You know, as technology evolves, 
the next generation of hotlines must be secured from new risks. It makes perfect sense. But it's definitely time to see this happen because leaders of nuclear armed states need to be able to get in touch with one another in the run up to or worse during a conflict or nuclear war in a worst case scenario. You know, these leaders, they can't rely on hopping on Zoom to try to de-escalate a nuclear conflict. And we know that today, any nuclear conflict or any type of conflict between nuclear armed countries is likely to be multipolar. It's not going to be like how it was during the Cold War. So I'm really thrilled with the progress that we've made on Catalink on both a technical and political level. And we're now presenting this idea to governments for further scrutiny, including from non-nuclear weapon states like Switzerland, who has come forward as our first official sponsor. So it's very exciting to see that there is a possibility for civil society, the private sector, the technology space to try to contribute to nuclear risk reduction. But it definitely needs to be a partnership approach because the risks are vast and varied. And we have to try to capture new ways of thinking to deal with them. Now, before we end, because our time is about to come to a close, um, congratulations on winning the Gorbachev Schultz Voices Youth Award. Coincidentally, we're taping this on the same day as a major event at Stanford that's commemorating Secretary Schultz's passing last year. As you as you sit at this moment. As the winner of this award, what do you see for the future of nuclear policy? Thank you. First and foremost, I have deep admiration and respect for Secretary Schultz. I met him when I was very young and, you know, forever for the rest of my life. I will definitely maintain that he has left a large, impactful um, legacy on how I think about these issues. We continue to work together throughout the years, especially on U.S.-Russia issues. And he really was able to impart a lot of knowledge through storytelling. And I know that he felt very strongly about diversity and youth inclusion. And it was a great opportunity when accepting this award to be able to share some statistics from Rethink Media that they hadn't revealed yet, which saw that of all the US media coverage on nuclear weapons in 2021 so far, that 86% of the forces quoted were men, 14% were women, and zeroing in on quotes from members of our community, the numbers only improved slightly. Quotes were from 69% men and 31% women for 2021, with 28% of the quote coming from people of color, while 72% came from white speakers. And of the total quotes from the disarmament and arms control community in US media from 2018 to 2021, 7% were from women of color, 15% from men of color, 16% from white women, and 62% from white men. So today I see a field that has immense promise, but is also in peril. We have to do better at talent acquisition and retention. We have to do better at improving not only just how we improve diversity through the lenses of gender and race, but also geography. And we have to capture young talent from a, a wider array of fields that nuclear weapons intersects with, because we're not going to be able to really create a movement or to try to enable civil society to hold governments to account if we don't try to capture every single angle um, through which we can talk about these issues. And they're very varied, health, environment, law. There are so many ways in which we can learn also from the climate movement and how that has really activated the next generation and hopefully divert some of their attention to the twin existential threat that Plowshares, the ELN, and all the other organizations in our community work on, which is the perils posed by nuclear weapons. Sahil, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, we really appreciate everything you're doing and, and your view from Europe. Thank you. Thank you for having me.
Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited by Alex Hall in Washington, D.C. and Delphine Vigil in San Francisco. Research by Desiree Cepetis and Harry Tarpey. Audio engineering and sound design by Michael Padilla and the Soundport Recording Studio in Grass Valley, California. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.